our first two conversations with Barbara and welcome viewers of Channel 13. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, Mark, it's so good to see you. And it's uh, very exciting that you are a candidate for uh, the seat of a uh, county commissioner. Uh, tell, us, uh, tell us something about why you feel that you want to, to um, become a, a commissioner. Barbara, first of all, let me just thank you for inviting me on your show. It's great to see you again. It's great to be back. Um, the, um, what I'd like to do is just tell you just a little bit about what county commissioners and county government does. Um, yes, yes, um, yes. County government is sort of provides an array of services to the residents of Barnstable County. It, it's sort of a, a hodgepodge. It's a mixture of services. For example, it has a registry of deeds where you file mortgages and other uh, sort of property instruments. Uh, it has a, a number of programs and services uh, that work or deliver services under the Health and Human Services Department. Uh, there's a Health and Environmental Department. Um, we have Children's Cove, which does a lot of service in the area of sexual abuse uh, uh, in children, providing services there. Um, there's roughly a $28 million budget and uh, roughly a couple of hundred employees. Um, if you wanted to characterize the role of the county, I would say that what it does is it, it works on providing services to the towns and the residents of Barnstable County that transcend municipal boundaries, the kinds of things that are needed across the board around the Cape. So for example, the Cape Cod Commission is one of the regulatory, it's one of the agencies in county government. The Cape Cod Commission provides a regulatory, has a regulatory role, but it provides land use services and planning assistance to the individual towns. Uh, the county works on wastewater planning, groundwater protection. Uh, we're heavily involved in uh, sampling of groundwater supplies to make sure that our drinking water is safe. Um, I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. What county commissioners do is they play a vital role in sort of setting the priorities for the region to make sure that as a region we're working hard on wastewater, clean water, coastal restoration. Um, we've got new issues coming and that we're going to have to spend more, well, they're here, but we're going to have to in the coming years spend more time on them, like climate change, which means dealing with erosion, dealing with a whole host of issues attended to climate change. I see that these are issues that municipal government couldn't possibly handle they, we don't have, municipal governments don't have the resources for, for that. So Often, oftentimes, I'm a selectman in Yarmouth. I'm a former town administrator in the town of Brewster, and I'm a former administrator in Provincetown. Um, in terms of my work, municipal government is very much a part of my career. Um, I started my career in Provincetown in the town manager's office. And after that, I was a sort of a community liaison for Congressman Gary Studs and Congressman Bill Delahunt, where I'd work with our towns all throughout the region to help them address them. And oftentimes, municipal government is very focused on the day, providing the day-to-day -day services that people need, you know, the, the education for our kids, uh, police and fire, um, and, uh, you know, public works taking care of our roads. Uh, most of our towns are really focused on the now. And uh, county government is very focused or has the opportunity for us to sort of try to address the issues of today and tomorrow, to address the issues long term. Um, wastewater planning and groundwater protection have been sort of um, very, very much a priority of county government. And these are issues that we're making, we're starting to make real progress on uh, right now. This is a, so, so good to hear because like a lot of people, I've always felt that county government was very much a presence in the wings of our lives. But from what you are saying, it's very much front and front center state, given, given all those uh, essential things that uh, have to be done. Exactly. Could the county has also just a couple of other services to mention. It has a cooperative extension program, which provides a lot of help to farmers and people that are interested in uh, the 4-H programs and other youth education programs. We have personnel that help uh, deal with ticks and tick education and help yes. us try to get a handle on Lyme disease. Uh, we have uh, an AmeriCorps program that is quite robust in providing help to all of our communities in the area of, in a variety of areas, quite frankly, 
Um, another area that saves the towns a lot of money is in county purchasing. Um, all the towns do bulk purchasing through the Barnstable County purchasing, uh, the, uh, the purchasing office there and the purchasing staff. Uh, it saves towns millions of dollars every year. And uh, this dredging program that the county has does a lot in terms of helping towns with the cost of dredging up ports and harbors. So, I mean, I could go on. The, again, the idea here is um, providing support to our municipalities, providing direct services to the residents of the county, and to, to focus as well on the, the challenges of today and tomorrow. And uh, the commissioners themselves play a huge role in just sort of setting the tone setting the priorities and that's that's important for cape cod uh and i'm excited about running for county commissioner uh, i'm looking forward to the uh, the campaign it's already started mm -hmm. and uh we're getting close to primary day which is september 1st i see now the um the candidacy is is um partisan it's uh yeah you know that's an interesting point that you Democrats mentioned barbara it's a partisan election and so many of our issues are really not partisan yes, yes. in nature. That's kind of the, that's a, something that I'd like to change. Um, I don't, I don't think you want, I don't, I don't think it's good to have partisan seats uh, in, a, in an area like this. I, I think our issues at the local level and regional level have no partisan uh, definition to them. Uh, oh, there's no, I, there's I, no I, Republican I, way to dredge a harbor or yeah. a democratic way to manage Lyme disease or deal with tick infestation things like that. So it would be nice to change that. But the reality is right now on the September 1st primary, uh, Democrats will be convening to select two candidates and the Republicans will be doing the same. So uh, I'm running for a spot. Uh, I'm, on, on the, I'm on the primary ballot, but I want to be one of the two that come out on top to run in the general election in November. Yes, well, and I, so many, so many commentators have talked about the fact that local government, municipal, county, and state is the place where things are, are getting done because it is apolitical rather than, rather than um, what's, what seems to be a stalemate at the federal level. So I would, I would hope that eventually we can make, make these, these issues nonpartisan. You're quite right. Our, our needs have nothing to do, they're not political, they're, they're real. And, uh, and so it seems uh, uh, whether or not the uh, county has some, uh, some ways of uh, responding to this uh, coronavirus. Well, I think what's, what we're witnessing during this crisis right now is the, the, the federal government really not stepping up to meet the challenge. Uh, the testing hasn't been nearly as robust as it needs to. Um, the access to equipment, training, I mean, a whole host of resources that the federal government just has not been able to adequately address. And it sort of shifted that burden during this crisis uh, to states and local governments. And uh, that, that is quite unfortunate. So um, what the county has done and uh, and it most likely will continue to do because this 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 crisis is going to be with us. But what the county has done is it's convened, helped convene a regional task force uh, to look at ways to uh, help local businesses and communities uh, uh, comply with some of the governor's advisories and to flag issues for the governor's uh, personnel, his task force on the reopening, to flag issues that might need some added attention uh, and people might need some help with. So the county's been very involved in that. The county's been very involved in helping get equipment, uh, helping set up a testing site and a range of other things. Uh, and I think uh, that's, a, that's a role that we're gonna have to spend more, more time in. One of the things that, speaking of the county and its role, one of the things that I've been very disappointed in has been the number of people who've become sick in, uh, in nursing homes. Yes, that that has been tragic. It, it it really is. It's borderline criminal, and uh, or maybe it is even in some cases criminal, for us as a country not to target at the first sign of this crisis the nursing homes and other facilities where we have people that are vulnerable, 
to sort of target them, make sure that they're getting the proper equipment, personnel, training, and assistance. I mean, we should have, we should have really hit those facilities first. And now that, now that we, you know, to some degree, and, you know, hindsight is always 2020. Uh, I think on the Cape going forward, we, we need to begin to identify those priority areas for attention so that should this get worse or should uh, this return or if we have a future outbreak, um, we can make sure that there's adequate care and support in our nursing homes, that if something were to happen, uh, we don't end up with the fatalities and the level of sickness that we have, that we've seen here on the Cape and elsewhere around the Commonwealth. I mean, the number of deaths, if there's one pocket where the death total and percentages have been the highest, it's been in uh, nursing home facilities. And that's just outrageous. We, yeah, yes. we should have done a much better job on that. And I think that's a lesson learned in terms of going to the future. So the county has, I think in this case, can play more of a role in this and can play a role in saving lives. Yes, County Board of Health has been valuable for all of us on the yes. case because of its water testing and, and issues that uh, need to be tested that we, things that we can't do at the municipal level. So you're quite right. The Barnstable County Health Department is probably a, one of the best, more... best regional health departments in the country. Really? Uh, okay. Yes. It's widely okay. recognized as being a leader in so many areas. Uh, we've been, we've had outstanding personnel in that department. Uh, and there's more we can do. Um, it requires uh, more leadership, more aggressive support for some of their initiatives and some of their ideas. Something that, um, you know, I, I, is, is important to me in terms of the health department is uh, finding new and innovative technologies to address our groundwater contamination issues, particularly wastewater. Uh, the county has played a huge role in developing uh, new technologies and we've got to double down in that area as well. So like I said, th th we have a number of uh, outstanding people serving in county government, particularly at the department head level and the, the health department is, uh, health and environmental department is one of those areas. Yes, and some of those problems are so peculiar to the Cape. And I think the Cape, especially our geography, indicates that we need regional, regional government. Um, certainly, well, uh, let me just add to that point. The, the state and the feds have basically, they oftentimes get preoccupied with their own things or their own political squabbles. Um, and, you know, often the Cape gets forgotten. Um, you know, we provide a lot of money, we provide a lot of talent. Uh, the Cape is incredibly important in terms of the economy of the Commonwealth, but often our needs fall by the wayside. So I think a robust county government with an aggressive group of county commissioners could play a huge role in getting folks focused on our needs and our issues. Yeah, it's good for, for the viewers to know that because I think that actually people who are new to the Cape, uh, I have heard thoughts, some not this is not common but one or two people i know think that oh it's just another level of bureaucracy and that could couldn't be farther from the truth these are important uh, needs that are being met at the county level yes and i think there are other ways we can play a role in helping save money um, i mean the cape itself we have a lot of government on cape cod um, and i think we need to find ways to better collaborate and streamline and share services rather than at the local level, just adding a new department or adding new personnel. Um, doing things regionally saves money. We've it's shown that yeah. and yes. uh, we can do more of it. And it seems to me too that um, you are playing a, a serious role in, uh, in, in looking at, the, at what climate changes. Yes, as the sea level rises, we're finding impacts on wetlands, uplands, we're finding impacts on our ponds uh, and uh, other water resources, even water supplies. Uh, we're seeing a potential uh, impacts there. Um, but just look at the erosion challenges. Um, yes. Erosion on the outer Cape, for example, has, is accelerating. Um, over the years, I worked on relocating uh, the Highland Light Lighthouse uh, about 15 years ago, it was very close to the, um, the, the, the edge of the outer Cape shoreline and we had to come up with the money and the resources to move it back. Same with the Nosset light. And uh, we thought that we wouldn't have to worry about relocating those lighthouses for at least another generation or two. Well, guess what? 
erosion has picked up, it's accelerating. A mm -hmm. lot of that has to do with sea level rise. And so we're losing much more of Cape Cod than on the outer Cape than we had, uh, we had previously planned. So erosion is gonna be a, continue to be a huge issue. It's accelerating. Um, now, now um, Mark, um, Falmouth has a, um, a very active uh, coastal resilience group. Um, and I, is the work that the commissioner, commission is doing, is that being communicated to not only groups in Falmouth that are concerned with climate change, but to all the other towns? I think that's, uh, is that happening? I'd like to see the county do more in the area of coastal restoration um, and in the coastal environment space. Um, I chair the Cape Cod Conservation District, and uh, our role is to help uh, restore and revitalize salt marshes and other wetland systems. Uh, we're working with the town of Falmouth, for example, on the Kunameset River restoration project. Our group will be involving, involved in funding some of the work in the second phase. Uh, we've been working with Betsy Gladfelder, who is, uh, just does an incredible job uh, for yes, the town. Yeah, and uh, we're gonna be working with her. I'd like to see the county play a more active role in supporting these efforts. Um, I've helped bring over $15 million in federal funds to do projects all over the Cape. And I think the county can help us leverage even more money. Um, and these are critical projects. Uh, we're not just restoring salt marshes uh, because you know they're beautiful and scenic. Uh, these are critical even in the area of climate change. So much carbon gets sequestered uh, in our wetland areas, that if we allow them to degrade, we lose that benefit. They're the nurseries for fish, uh, and they and and the list goes on in terms of environmental benefits. So these are things yes, that the yes. county needs to play more of an active role in, and I certainly want to do that if I'm elected as a county commissioner. That, that's a, that's very important. Uh, certainly, we have that uh, not only climate change but the current uh, degradation of our our um, certain estuaries and ponds with uh, the buildup of nitrogen. And I know that, uh, that some of the experimentation that's been doing at, at the county level is going to be critical. Yes. Okay. Can you tell us something about yourself? Right now, um, I'm a resident of Yarmouth. I've been on the Cape most of my life. Um, and uh, I'm also a Yarmouth selectman uh, for the town of Yarmouth. Uh, I teach. Uh, government at Cape Cod Community College. And I'm also uh, working for Suffolk University and establishing a master's degree program in public administration here on Cape Cod. And, uh, and the MPA program is a degree that I have. Um, I've taught public administration before uh, to many students who've become town administrators. Uh, and what I'm interested in doing is help groom some more talent on Cape Cod, our future town administrators. Um, but the degree itself um, is very useful for those who aspire to leadership positions in the nonprofit world and in healthcare. And uh, many of the people who've come out of the Suffolk University MPA have uh, been leaders in our towns and in our communities and in our healthcare institutions and in the nonprofit world, which as we all know, each of these areas is vital uh, to each community. So we're trying to build a bench on Cape Cod uh, because a lot of administrators are getting ready to retire and we have a wealth of talent here. So I've been committed for the past year or so to help get this program up and running. We've been successful. We've recruited a good group of students. Uh, we're gonna be starting in the fall. Our classes will be held at Barnstable Town Hall. Uh, the town manager there has been incredibly helpful to us. So I'm very excited about that. So that's something that I'm working on. Um, but I started my career in municipal government in Provincetown once I got out of school. And I, I became the town manager there and worked on a host of projects and the uh, challenges for the town, groundwater contam contamination, working with the fishing industry and helping the fishing industry develop and grow. Um, and after I left Provincetown, I went to join the staff of Congressman Studs. And that's actually when I had the opportunity to start working closely on problems in Falmouth. Um, I, f I remember my very first day on the job, Congressman Studs brought me to Falmouth. He had one of his uh, famous open town meetings at the yeah. Morse Pond School. 
And uh, the issue at the moment was groundwater contamination to the town's wells in, um, in the Ashuman Valley. Oh, yes, and, I remember that. Yeah, so this was 1985. And so here's this sort of uh, relatively young maverick type uh, full of energy being told that I got to work with the town of Falmouth to figure out how we're going to get the military uh, to take to address this issue because the pollution impacting the Ashumid Valley water supply wells um, that was all emanating from the base. And then we came to find out that it was coming directly from the base treatment plant. So my job was to uh, not only help Falmouth with this, but as we studied the pollution problems more at the base, we found out that all the Upper Cape Towns had groundwater contamination issues. And so uh, I played a role in helping shape a plan um, and, and, and a more active role in helping getting it funded to the tune of almost $1 billion. That's one with a B billion dollars in funding to address the groundwater contamination problems at the base and adversely impacting the wells and water supplies of the Upper Cape Towns. So I became very versed on groundwater contamination and how to address this uh, challenge. Uh, we still have contamination problems. Uh, they're not gone. No. And, uh, we need to step up our efforts to deal with some of these new and emerging contaminants like PFAS. You probably heard that, PFAS. These are contaminants that we're now seeing in Falmouth, Mashpee, Bourne, other Cape Towns. Uh, Barnstable has had a huge uh, a PFAS, a PFAS problem. I'm using the acronym largely because it's an incredibly long name that's almost impossible to accurately pronounce. Uh, but these are chemicals that are in our water supply that shouldn't be there. So we need to get them out. And the first priority is to find them all or identify them all to do the kind of aggressive investigations that are necessary that we once did out at the military base. We've got to do these in other towns so that we can get our arms around the extent of this problem. And that's a priority. I want to see county government do more and more work in this area so that we can assure future generations that we'll have decent, clean, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, so contaminant-free uh, drinking water for, for years to come. That, that's very exciting, very net, very important. What, what yes. might be some, what are some of the roadblocks to that, to making that effort? Uh, well, some of, the, some of the roadblocks, it's basically, it's making it a priority and doing it, focusing attention on oh, the it. Um, the political well, will. Yeah, it is. Uh, sometimes we get reactive. Uh, some of these things, we, we can't be reactive. We can't afford to be. We've got to be proactive. We got to get on top of them and find ways to address them. So uh, we know the problems are out there. So let's get on top of it. It's leadership and it's money and it's time and it's energy. But um, given the importance of protecting public health and our drinking water on the Cape, we just got to elevate that issue as a priority and go after it. Uh, the other obstacle that we face is the Trump administration. Every time standards are set for con for for treating or uh, setting levels of contaminants. Uh, that are allowable for drinking water, the Trump administration keeps watering down the standards. So uh, that's not helpful to our cause at all. Um, we need to have strict standards, standards that protect public health, that are defensible, not defensible uh, by, by objective science, not by the, the yes. scientists hired by the, uh, the special interests and the chemical manufacturers. Yes, and uh, it may even be that uh, in our drinking water there are yet to be d discovered uh, um, problems. I'm wondering now whether whether we've heard about Flint, Michigan, but that may be true. Uh, lead may also be present here. Well, that's 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 exactly it. I'm glad you brought that up because f we have our own versions of Flint, Michigan, yes. um, and I don't want to panic people or scare them. These. But the, the, these are easily issues that we can tackle. We just have to focus on them. Um, you know, the, the list of things to address. Yeah, exactly the, the background that we need. Yeah, um, I think Pilgrim is an issue that the county needs to focus in on. We've been basically missing an action on that for a while. Um, that's a very serious, what's going to happen to the contaminated uh, f fuel rods there? Are they going to be properly stored or are they going to be you know, uh, a health hazard and a safety hazard for us in the years to come. We should be at the table helping 
make sure Cape residents are protected. Um, and uh, the bridges, the bridges are in rough shape. We all know all of our bridges were built during the Great Depression on Cape Cod, and many of them need to get replaced now. They're sort of reaching the end of their useful life. So we got to advocate for a more robust transportation program. We have opportunities in rail. We have opportunities in doing more in public transportation. So for me, Cape Cod always comes first. Uh, it's Cape Cod first, putting the people of Cape Cod first. And I think our job is, is to sort of get in front of uh, the state government and the federal government and help figure out ways we can work together to solve these problems. And um, I know that the, the county is also concerned about affordable housing. That's something that's keeping young people away from the kinds of uh, young people you'd like to see come to the Cape to take part in exactly. government need to be able to find houses that they can afford. Well, I just uh, finished up a tenure as the chairman of the board of the Housing Assistance Corporation. Uh, the Housing Assistance Corporation is based in Hyannis. It provides housing assistance uh, to residents throughout Barnstable County and the islands. It also is a leader and uh, an advocate for affordable housing. The agency also develops affordable housing. Uh, we just finished a blueprint on and a strategy on how to uh, aggressively tackle our affordable housing problems on Cape Cod. I'm very proud of this report. It's called Housing, uh, the Cost of Doing Nothing. And uh, it can be easily uh, got, secured on the, at, the, at the Housing Assistance Corporation website. Um, but that itself can serve as a blueprint for some of our efforts at the county level. Uh, at the county, we're doing some interesting things there, don't get me wrong. Uh, we have great data, great information, but it's what we need to do is start translating some of these ideas and some of these plans into action, get them off the shelves and start exactly. going forward with this stuff. Yes, communicating those ideas to local boards that are concerned with, so that we don't have uh, not just duplication of effort, but so exactly. we don't miss some good ideas. Yeah, Falmouth is a community, for example, with this enormous talent and energy. Um, I think the county can be a, 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 it needs to be more of a partner uh, going forward in helping the town uh, address some of these. Falmouth's done, done yeoman's work in the area of affordable housing, but it can't do it alone. It needs help. Exactly, um, exactly. Mm. It's, it's, it's really exciting to think about all the things that uh, are happening and more that can happen. Uh, Mark, I'd like to I'd like to find out what your take is on this current protest movement that's sweeping the country. Uh, people in search of uh, racial justice. What's your What's your view of what's happening, and whether or not that will these protests will make a difference? Well, I think we're at probably um, one of the a turning point moment in American history. Um, where there's sort of a great awakening that's going on about the serious racial problems here in our country. Um, you know, I worked in 2008 on the election of uh, President Obama, and um, I spent a lot of time knocking on doors in New Hampshire and elsewhere, helping him get elected. And I remember standing uh, during the inauguration, I happened to be uh, on Capitol Hill uh, while he was speaking. And I remember I was seated in an area right up front. I was very I'm, I was very lucky to get a nice spot right up front. And I remember looking out over the, the mall in Washington, D.C. and seeing hordes of people there to celebrate not just the election of this man, but what we thought was a turning point in American history where we elected right. the first African-American president. And I thought it was a turning point. Um, there were people next to me from southern states uh there are preachers and people in the clergy of all different uh races and uh it was it was a joyous occasion and then to see sort of what's unfolded you know during those two terms and then to see what's happening today and it's it's just so much bubbling up right now um right. as a nation we realize that we still have so far so much further to go but we also have a country by and large that is unwilling to stop making noise, let's say, or making a scene because we have to change now. Change is needed now. We need to heal these racial divisions. We need to take steps to end 
the hatred, the division, and uh, the energy is is just palpable. Um, what has struck me is been uh, the the number of uh, white people at these rallies. Um, the, yes. the way it, the way in which this has galvanized uh, the, the 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 white community, which is which is it's about time. Right, Mark. I'm going to ask you to uh, speak to the audience about the election. First of all. There are two seats that are on the ballot. There'll be two seats uh, that need to be filled on the Barnstable County Commission. Um, but before we get to the general election, there's going to be a primary. Um, there isn't any of any contest on the Republican side. All the action is on the Democratic side. There are three candidates vying for two spots uh, on the Democratic ballot uh, on September 1st. Obviously, I'm asking uh, Falmouth residents and people throughout Barnstable County to support me in the Democratic primary. And then after that, there's the general election in November, November 3rd. So on that ballot, there will be uh, four candidates. There'll be two Democrats, and then there'll be two that are not Democrats. Um, the two individuals that are on are Republicans, and uh, they're very strong Trump supporters. And so on the ballot, people have uh, choices to make, and, but they have to vote for two. Um, the last election cycle, there was a lot of bullet voting. And so hopefully in this election cycle, there'll be uh, people voting for two, two candidates and uh, we can elect the two strongest. Like I said, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to uh, win the support of people in Barnstable County. And I would, ha I would be honored to... Uh, represent Falmouth residents and all of people, all the people in Barnstable County and uh, to work on the issues facing the Cape, uh, like I said, both today and in t tomorrow. Um, like I said, we have major challenges ahead of us. And I think I come to this race with the experience, the background and the uh, intestinal fortitude, so to speak, and the persistence yes. to tackle. Yes. And uh, particularly your, your experience in all areas of uh, of, of town government, and also knowing the Cape as well as you do. But Mark, now, uh, what is going to happen with respect to that election? Is the county doing anything about uh, mail-in voting? This well, these all, like all elections, it's the local town clerks that are the focal point. Um, and so what will happen is, is in the September 1st primary, uh, there's another big race that's going to be attracting a lot of attention. Uh, it'll be the race for in the U.S. Senate seat. You have uh, Joe Kennedy challenging Ed Markey. Uh, that'll attract a fair amount of attention. So when people go to vote in that race, they'll obviously have the opportunity to vote in the county commissioner race as well. So that's important to keep in mind. So um, th those are the two principal races, the, the local uh, state rep races. There's there are there's no contested uh, ballots. Uh, there's no open seats. So in Barnstable County, it's going to be these two races that will basically occupy a lot of the attention. Yes. Well, this is um, something that all of us need to keep our eyes open on. So we'll be sh be sure to be prepared for voting. Getting out the vote is really critical. It is. It this is. And, and Falmouth is obviously. Um, in recent elections has really stepped up and turned out in good numbers. So I'm hoping for the same situation, uh, you know, both in September and in November. I think November is going to be a huge turnout. Uh, yeah, yes. And uh, I, I think so. it'll be very strong. And, you know, while, while thinking about this, uh, this demand for racial justice, it reminds me that um, the county has a... Um, a Committee on Human Rights, is it? And I think you had something to do with that. Uh, yes, I did. I, when I worked for Congressman Gary Studs, um, who, by the way, was the first openly gay congressman to serve in the Congress, um, when I worked for him, we were very strong supporters and advocates for creating a countywide uh, human rights advisory committee or commission. And uh, we're glad to see that there. Um, let me just also mention in terms of my own background, um, uh, when I, before I finished, before I started my, my graduate studies, I was a VISTA volunteer, which is kind of like the domestic equivalent 
of the Peace Corps. Yes, yes. And uh, I served in the inner city of Boston during the, de the height of desegregation of the Boston schools. And I can tell you um, that was quite an incredible time in terms of when we talk about racial tensions. Yes, uh, yes. that was an incredible time in in our history, and uh, so I, I I've had some experience in this area, yeah. and uh, I do think it is very helpful to have a human rights commission. I think it can play. I think we can, you know, the commission itself has been cut in ter in the past in terms of its funding, and it's always had in the last few years. There's always been some question about our its status. And I think we've got, to the extent that there's any uncertainty, we've just got to end it. We've got to make it very clear that this commission is going to be here to stay. And we've got to work with it to play a more active role in helping heal some of these divisions. Um, one of the things that I'm also doing is I, I, I work for the uh, Mashpee Wampanoag tribe as a consultant. And uh, the tribe has had its challenges. Uh, yes. It, yes. it is a community, the tribe as a community has been a victim of what I would consider to be a racial injustice. The tribe has been discriminated against. It's been treated poorly by the federal government. And as a group of people, the Trump administration is trying to take away their reservation. And uh, I'm proud to work with them and have worked with them for many, many years and helping them gain recognition and helping the tribe get uh, a, a, its land uh, set aside in trust as a reservation and then to find ourselves with the tribe that greeted the pilgrims now being on the verge of losing their reservation is just unconscionable. Uh, it's something that's very, very disgraceful. So, um, you know, throughout my career, I've had the battles that where we're dealing with these kinds of issues front and center. Uh, I do believe that we will prevail when it comes to the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. Uh, I do think we can do more to heal uh, divisions, not just in this country, but to the extent that they're here on Cape Cod. Um, and uh, I think uh, there are lots of opportunities to do that at the county level. But the key one is is not just keeping a Human Rights Advisory Commission, but to help um, secure its status for, for the future and uh, provide it the resources that it needs uh, to, to, do a, to do an effective job. Mark, with, with so many people looking to make change, and finding that marching and making and holding signs isn't uh, always the most effective thing. How can somebody engage with that commission? Is it? Well, I think what we have to do is actually get, to, uh, we have to create open to opportunities for public involvement across the board. Exactly, um, exactly. All right, across the board. I'd like to see a a county uh, leadership academy. I'd like to see other ways we can help promote public involvement and in citizen participation. Um, I think uh, I'd like to see uh, the ability of some of these boards uh, to meet in other communities to get out more. Um, and also, I think it needs to have the support of the county commissioners to tackle some thorny issues. Exactly. You know? And, uh, you know, I mean, we, we've got we've got sex trafficking trafficking going on in Barnstable County. Uh, oh. That's a that that that's that's sort of been swept under the radar screen. But we've got to we've got to tackle that. We, we we and we do have some. We can do more on the, in terms of uh, healing racial wounds here on the Cape. I mean, just look at the tribes' difficulties in securing their Aboriginal rights. They have certain Aboriginal rights to fish, and to and and and. Uh, and, and literally coexist in many of these inc incredibly important uh, conservation areas on the Upper Cape. So how are we helping them preserve their rights as, as Native people? Exactly. And I think the um, energy that's being, um, that we're feeling uh, around these protest movements, it's moving people to want to participate. So they do. Right, we need to find ways to allow citizens to be part of these of the of the change by by connecting with uh, county government and. Right, I think I think one of the roles that we can also play is helping channel that energy in terms of real reform. You know, yes. what are some of the reform initiatives that are underway that require that would be beneficial in terms of more public advocacy or more public support? Um, I mean, that that's that's sometimes. 
often forgotten. We'll have protests, we'll have rallies sometimes on a particular issue. And then when the protests are gone and the rallies are gone, um, you know, there's not much left of a change of public policy. Exactly. You know, when you look back in 19, the 1960s during the civil rights marches on Washington, uh, Martin Luther King actually had a specific legislative initiatives in mind uh, that they were rallying behind, and that was the Civil Rights Act. Uh, they wanted a new Civil Rights Act to reinvigorate the civil rights provisions that were already codified in statute, and that's what people lobbied for and fought for. And then uh, eventually we, we did get a new and, and revitalized civil rights Act. Um, the problem is today, many of the provisions that were adopted back then have sort of been forgotten uh, or ignored completely yes. by the Trump administration. So, yeah. um, you know, the federal government has a lot more tools to utilize, and which they're not, but we need to find ways in which we can step in to help fill the void and do so, uh, do so aggressively. It'll yeah. be controversial, but it's worth doing. Right. I think you will be encouraged by something that happened just uh, a few nights ago at town meeting in Falmouth. Uh, town meeting passed a uh, demand, of an article for a, a police officer that will work with the schools and the town to be sure that, uh, that racial equality is, uh, is supported. I know at town meeting people were quite proud of the, the measures that were adopted there. And I think that's a lesson for us across the board in other towns. What can we do specifically? And that's what we have to be focused on specifically uh, to deal with uh, um, the need to address racial inequities, racial injustice in each of our communities. We just, we just shouldn't assume that everything's fine. We need to listen and pay much more attention uh, to what's happening in our community. Well, you know, the Barnstable County Commissioner's Office, it's sort of a focal point. It's a platform. It's a way to draw attention to things that are important. It's yeah. like a bully pulpit. You can, you can say, hey, this is something we got to focus on. And uh, this is an exciting time right now. Yeah. Yes, and we have know. problems and challenges. But I, I do believe this, that what's going on in terms of the, the protests about race uh, I think are part of something that's broader and deeper. Um, it's, it's, I saw that uh, the women's marches in Washington after Trump was elected. Yes. Um, I'd like to think that this energy can be challenged in a way that truly revitalizes our democracy. That's what I'm hoping for. It revitalizes <laughs> our democracy. Somehow out of this, we I can bring that. government I closer to the people. Right. And it must happen, because if we don't do something, we will see our institutions erode. It's, it's really a dangerous time, too. So this right. Yeah, I think if people weren't aware of the fragility right. of our democracy uh, before Trump was elected, I think they're, uh, they're uh, becoming much more in tune with how fragile democracy is and how critical these institutions are. Yes. Um, I mean, look what's happening. You get the Justice Department basically turned into a corrupt instrument of the president. Yes. Um, people, people are horrified over that. Obviously, the, the police beatings. You know, I, I watched a press conference with a leader of one of the police unions, and he was asked if everything, you know, what would he change? And he'd say he changed nothing. I couldn't believe it. That's part of the problem, too. There are leaders within the police community that need to change. That, that's, that's right. We, we, haven't, uh, we haven't learned enough about what goes on, the sort of power that police unions have. That's correct. Now, I'm lucky in the town of Yarmouth, and I think to some degree throughout the Cape, we have police departments being led by incredibly talented chiefs who uh, are just as horrified uh, at these recent instances of, you know, literally murder, um, they've been just as horrified as we have. Uh, and um, they've spoken out loudly and clearly how uh, these are the kinds of things that should not be tolerated. They've denounced uh, the Floyd uh, tragedy. Right. And um, we have a county actually that has a training academy that's training police officers on Cape Cod and it's being led by people who, who get this, who understand this. And so right. I think through our training academy, I think to some degree the county can play a role in helping, uh, you know, 
helping spread the lessons uh, that we've learned about dealing with some of these situations. And it's just recently that uh, Massachusetts has become a card state. That is to say that um, I don't know whether the legislation has passed, but it has, but I think it, it has that our, our policemen will have a, be certified so that yes. they can then be decertified. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I think that is an incredibly important reform that'll help us get at the, the way in which some unions will shield yes, people. Exactly. Exactly, and get around that. There'll be, different, there'll be some fairly clear standards and guidelines that have to be followed. And if they're not, uh, there's a potential threat of decertification or delicensing, and uh, that can be a very, that can be even a much a, a very powerful deterrent yes. to inappropriate yeah. behavior. I'm, I'm with you completely on that. I'm glad you pointed that out. Well, I think all of these. I'm so um, pleased to be hearing this, and I think we have uh, lots of work ahead, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again, and also to. Uh, keeping aware of the election that's coming up in September to, uh, to vote for you. And um, certainly a lot of uh, the, this will be, we'll find out there's some uncertainty, but by uh, September, I'm sure that we'll have some to where we will vote and how we will vote. And we'll be sure to be thinking about you as a candidate. Uh, do you have one last thing to say to our viewers? No, I just want to say, Barbara, thank you so much for giving me the chance to chat with you and and uh, talk a little bit about the issues of concern to, to the people of the Falmouth area. This was this was wonderful to, to, to be back with you and to talk again. I enjoyed it immensely. I want to thank you. And once again, uh, for the people of Barnstable County, um, I would I would welcome the the honor to represent you as a as a county commissioner. If you have any in, in interest in following up with me, just check out electmarkforest.com. That's electmarkforest.com. I've got an email address. You can just go there online and drop me a note, and uh, I would love to follow up uh, or find ways to get you involved in my campaign. Once again, Barbara, thank you. Thank you so much. And I thank you very much. And thank you, viewers, for tuning in to Conversations with Barbara. We'll be seeing you soon. Take care and stay safe.